Foster is going to run it out past the 40 in the Giants territory. He is going to go all the way. Touchdown, Chicago. Trying to find somebody open. And throws an interception. And it's Charles Woodson's 55th of his career. Dies for the touchdown, San Francisco. I want to play desperately, and I'm going to try to drive everyone nuts until they give me a shot. Carved through an almost impossible 336 career interceptions. See that? Yeah. We have here the uh, Brett Favre interceptions calendar. It's the lovable kicking bear doll. And guess what? It comes with its own goalpost. Isn't that neat? I am doing that so, right now. Yeah. What's what's interesting about this week in NFL is the Jets blowing out the Patriots. Now, after all of the years of the 2000s and Tom Brady, did you ever think you'd see the day? I mean, not just Aaron Rodgers playing for the Jets, but come on, the Jets blowing the Patriots out? I'm even even at home. I, I don't like. I watched that game, and it looked like there wasn't a Patriots team on the field. It looked like they were playing a high school team. I'm not used to seeing Jets' competence, given what we saw with Zach Wilson last year when Aaron Rodgers goes down after four plays. I'm not used to seeing, like, converting on third down or, you know, getting a big game Catching 16 yards on first down. I mean, right. again, they look like an NFL offense, which is what they've been promised all along, these starving Jets fans who've been wandering out in the desert with no playoff appearances since 2010. Um, and I think... I don't know. Have we lowered the bar so far that if you look competent against an opponent that, quite frankly, is still kind of in a rebuild phase with the Patriots trying to figure out who they are and, and what they've got, I don't know. Like, we saw them on Monday night against the Niners, and they scuffled. And then the last two yeah. weeks, you know, the second week, they kind of pulled one out. And then this week, they look like a team that preseason people said, yeah, they could be in the AFC East mix. They could give Buffalo some headaches. So. Well, and that's the thing about the new NFL schedules. Like week one feels like your preseason game because you have 16 more weeks after that to make magic happen. Um, I got to say, though, like the Patriots, it, it, the, I know the Panthers are the worst team in the league, but are they really? I mean, the Patriots look like they didn't have a defense. They didn't have much of an offense to write home about. I know they got a field goal, but... They could have easily not had that. And it's just such a strange departure from, and this has got to be what folks felt like when Steve Young retired. Like right. it's got to be what, you know, when uh, the Packers won Super Bowl II and then decided to take a vacation for 30 years or the Bears after 1985 <laughs> until, you until know, right. forever. Right. Um, until they went back with Gross Rexman. Um, you know, it's just it's just weird to think like these these teams that, you know, we've revered for so long. You know, was it just Belichick and Brady that made the Patriots? Uh, I don't think so, because they had amazing Hall of Fame caliber players. And, you know, you don't win seven Super Bowls and appear in what, nine total, I think, without uh, some kind of magic happening. But it just. But when you have a quarterback and a head coach. When you have a quarterback that the team believes in and is going to lead them, no matter what you think of him personally, the players are behind him. If you have a head coach that can make adjustments, so I'll, I'll take that to the the Brady Belichick idea in that they had a couple of other All Pro players, but the rest of the team fell in line. It's kind of like the Jordan Jackson Bulls. Everyone, you know, you have Jordan and Pippen, so you've got your great players, and, and I'll throw Horace Grant in there, or and or Dennis Rodman. But then when you're filling a bench out with, like, Mel Tucker or Bobby Hansen, who, you know, would have a hard time playing at the Y, but those guys fit a system, they believe in their top players, they accept the leadership, no matter how harsh it was for Michael Jordan, because it was harsh, but he was always pushing everyone around him. And then you've got someone like Phil Jackson, who is just... The puppeteer behind the scenes, knowing which string to pull every time, if you can put those things together, th that that's what happens, right? Now, it's also, well, is this their second game that they played last week? Or is yeah. that their third game? Third game. For the Jets. Third game. Third, third game. game. We're, we're still only three, you know, 
three weeks into the season. So l let's see what happens on a go forward here. But I'm looking at my bears, and I see, because we have to go here at some point, so might as well just go here right now. I see an incompetent head coach, again, why they didn't get rid of him in the first place. I'm so sick of the defensive-minded head coaching. I, I don't want to hear that anymore. Welcome to the Bears for the past 30 years, like you said. And at this pace, we won't be in the Super Bowl again until 2085. And I, I think the quarterback, the, the players believe in him, right? W one more thing. You take Justin Fields, you drop him into Pittsburgh, he now has the highest QB rating in the league, I believe. And he's, yeah, 2-0. and oh. I, I was having a conversation with someone at school, and they're saying, well, Justin Fields is just a game manager. Uh, great if he's a game manager. He's 2-0. and oh, And he's leading the league in QB rating. I, I, I don't... So what is it? Is it the player or the system? Mike Tomlin has never, as, as improbable as this sounds, he has never had a, a losing record as an NFL head coach. He's had plenty of eight and eight seasons, perhaps, if you look up his, his career stats, but the man has never come in seven and nine, six and 10, five and 11. So you take a Justin Fields, someone that admittedly has athletic gifts, and you put him with a coach who just knows how the NFL works inside and out, doesn't always get to the mountaintop, but can, can win regular season games and even a division game in the playoffs. And, and even if with a really great squad, you know, go further. Look what he's doing early with that kind of leadership versus what you're stating uh, as Eberflus uh, and so forth. But, but again, you're, you're coming in admittedly with a little bit of a chip saying, I just don't like this guy. I don't think he's the right guy. I don't think we're going to go anywhere with him. And that very well may be the case. But if the Bears rolled off a three- or four-game winning streak, would that change your perception of your coach? Or would you just say, you know what, they're winning despite him. They're winning because of the players on the field. They've all bonded with each other. Like, do you just see him as an anchor around the team's neck, no matter what the win-loss record looks like at this point? I mean, is he basically baked in? Or do you find room that you could say, you know what, he's figured it out. Somehow the ghost of Bill Walsh has, like, touched his shoulder. But they were... They were saying that last year. That's why he's back because of how the season wound up ending, and nothing is. But nothing's changed. So are the players doing it, or was it the head coach that did it? Did like player pride kick in at some point, and they feel like they need to finish it out? Some players would just give up and be like, "Yeah, the season's over." Right? Look at the what happened in Texas with Lovey Smith when he had to lose that game to get the number one pick, and he wins because he just has pride as a coach, and his players have that pride too even though that team was doggone awful. Uh, so let's go to your little scenario. Let's just say they rip off three or four in a row. There's a difference between it coming from the system and coming, to me, coming from the quarterback. Those, those could be two separate things, or they could be one thing. Except the pattern that I've seen for the past Eberflus years is it's going to be one or the other. It, it's, I, I don't, I don't see those things merging together. That was my problem with them, re with them retaining him this year. You're bringing in a rookie QB. You could have put in a whole new system that might have been built around him a little bit more because you have these incredible assets around him, which we haven't had in a while, right? And instead, you keep, you keep the same guy that could not get it done with, to me, a serviceable QB. Serviceable. I mean, he's not Mitch Trubisky where he's just staring at one side of the field the entire time. And, and one more thing, and I'll turn it back to you guys. When I see that picture on the sideline of Caleb Williams making the exact same, and I sent that to you guys, making the exact same face as Justin Fields, what, 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 is that, what does that tell you? And then I also sent you a picture of Aaron Rodgers going to hug his coach, or the coach going to hug Rodgers, and Rodgers kind of pushes him away, and... Even though they played it off in the in the uh, in press interview later on, it, it's it still like confused me a little bit that that would happen. But again, if they're getting it done, I don't I, I don't know. Believe I don't know. believe the body language when they first do it versus whatever they come up with against reporters at the end. Yeah, because it's in the moment. Right. What you saw was genuine. 
Now, what it means is open to interpretation, but what you, that moment, that sort of reflexive, like, hey, don't, don't touch me, or however you want to read that, that was like the real deal, the real McCoy. Uh, and, and the rest of it is just the lawyers, you know, stepping in saying, quick, say that you guys are really friends and that none of that matters. <clears throat> well, if ever there was a show of a rivalry between a coach and a quarterback, we've seen it plenty with Aaron Rodgers over the years, and that's, quite clear with Mike McCarthy and it's basically Aaron Rodgers and anybody he disagrees with in the moment he will just ignore them and say I'm going to do what I'm going to do and you're going to deal with it and we'll deal with the fallout later win or lose um, but that brings us gentlemen to of course we are back on cut the cheese poke the bear roast the niner I want to kick it off today with the 49ers at the LA Rams. This is a good rivalry game here in week three, and I'm excited to see this matchup. I think the Rams are looking up and down. I think the 49ers are looking up and down with all their injuries. Gold Rush, what's your take? What do you think? Gentlemen, this game is going to feel awfully like a third preseason game as far as what you're going to see on the field. The, the injury bug has bitten the Niners hard, Fortunately, none of them at this point appear to be season or career threatening. Uh, but that being said, it's a lot to ask an offense that is built on multiple options, flood the zone, and attack you from many different ways when some of your best attackers will be watching in uh, jumpsuits. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, as we know, is on the IR. He's not eligible to return to action until a Thursday night matchup in early October, I want to say the 10th, October 10th against the Seahawks, would be the first time, again, assuming everything heals, uh, NFL insiders are reporting that it could take up to six weeks to clear out this tendonitis, Achilles and tendonitis woes that he's been having. Debo Samuel injured his knee on the third, on the last three plays or somewhere in there in the losing effort against the Vikings uh, last Sunday. So that was ill-timed and, and, and ill-afforded because he was not only your receiver, but he was also getting some carries to you know in the backfield to keep defenses honest without McCaffrey in there. Although Jordan Mason, two games in, 147 yards in week one, <clears throat> 100 yards on uh, eight carries, uh, or no, uh, tw 20 carries, 100 yards and a touchdown in a losing effort against the Vikings. So... He seems durable. I even saw one NFL analyst breathlessly say, he's the next Marshawn Lynch. I'm not going to go there yet. But he's certainly a forward-pounding running back. Like McCaffrey's a beast, too. McCaffrey does not want to be tackled. And I think Jordan Mason has similar, uh, you know, you're going to have to really work to bring me down kind of a thing. But McCaffrey also has a little bit more of the say the agility the the I can I can hit a hole and then on a dime you know make this cut here that you know very few athletes right now are making. I think Jordan Mason is just a bull rushing forward and just going to try to batter you perhaps. Or is he just young? Or, is he yeah, just young? The confidence. I look at Adrian Peterson at the same age and he was running over DBs in the backfield secondary. I don't know. I uh, I think he's going to have a good game, a good year, but I I get a little hesitant around this person is going to step up and fill the shoes of a Christian McCaffrey or a Darren Jones or any of these big names we know. Um, that's my worry with the Packers, to be honest, is we had a great running game against Indy. Indy's not a great defense, but it was – you know, we didn't want to trust Malik with the offense he doesn't really know yet. And I got to be honest with you guys. I see some promise in our young running backs. I think we've got a good core. It's definitely serviceable for what we want to do. But like with Mason, I, I worry about, is it just the magic of being young week in, week out? And when you're running a young player like that who doesn't have the NFL experience of going up against, you know, NFL caliber defenses because college is a completely different game. I, uh, I worry about the injuries. You know, you get these young guys out there who don't protect themselves as well. Haven't had these hard hits for a couple of years. 
you know, they're not really built for being the guy right out of the draft or even within a year of the draft sometimes. So yeah. that's, that's un, my concern. Uh, although against the Titans, I don't know that it's going to make a difference. Right. No, Mason, like I say, it, it's been promising. He certainly hasn't, you haven't looked and said, boy, they're really losing in the running game with McCaffrey out. NFL defenses, particularly guys who have played, you know, seven, eight, nine campaigns, they're going to watch the tape. They're going to be ready for some of this. You know, he's going to have games where he's struggling to get 56 yards on 14 carries, et cetera. And the thing you want to worry about, whether it's Aaron Jones or, or Jordan Mason or anything like that, again, these young guys, these veteran savvy guys, you look at Fred Warner and how he punched that ball out in the Vikings game, and they're literally basically crossing the plane of the goal line, and he just delivers a right cross, knocks the ball out, Niners recover, preventing a Minnesota touchdown, which would have made it further out of reach. Nevertheless, that's a veteran-savvy move right there, and there's a lot of NFL safeties and linebackers who, with the young guys, they, you know, ball protection. I worry about turnovers. With these young guys, you know, they, they think we're going to get on Sports Center, we're going to get up the sidelines and charge, and if they're not paying attention and they're not doing the fundamentals, that's when somebody, you know, an eight-year vet slides in and, and rips the ball out of your hands and suddenly, you know, you're the goat and you're on the bench with your, your making that Caleb Williams face. Um, so the Niners are banged up. There'll be no this week against the Rams. There'll be no McCaffrey. There'll be no Devo Samuel. There'll be no George Kittle who injured himself in practice this week, uh, I want to say on Wednesday. So he's been ruled out. Nick Bosa's dealing with a rib, although I believe he's just questionable. Uh, Chaverius Ward, uh, one of the better corners that the Niners have had recently, uh, he's also got some stuff around the ankle. So it's a team that basically this week it's going to be a heavy dose of Jordan Mason. It's going to be Brock Purdy, uh, whom... As a 49er fan and as one of the biggest Brock Purdy supporters from Mr. Irrelevant to where he is now, yeah, you can look at his stats the first two weeks, you know, 319 yards against the Vikings, a touchdown. He also had one pick and he, the ball fell out of his hand, you know, caused for a fumble. So I, he has not played at a uh, all-star, all-pro, Pro Bowl type campaign yet. It's early. But he's going to need to have to have one of those in a uh, Rams stadium. This is a Rams team that just got lit up, and I mean lit up, probably the second worst beating of week two uh, against a division rival, the Cardinals. I mean, nobody saw the Cardinals putting 41 on the Rams. I mean, yeah, maybe a 26-21 to 21 game where the Cardinals, just like they used to do to the Cowboys all the time, they torment you and they get a couple of turnovers early and they march down and suddenly you're playing from behind. But they absolutely shredded anything the L.A. Rams had. And the Rams, they're 0-2 for the first time in Sean McVay's career, right? Even worse so than their Super Bowl hangover year, where I think they went 6-10 and and didn't even yeah, get a sniff of the division. So you've got a Rams team that's angry and embarrassed and they're playing at home and they're 0-2 Then they don't want to go to 0-3. No NFL team does. But they're dealing with serious injuries too. Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua are both out and they're not out like, well, maybe they'll play at game time. Like, they're not putting on their helmets today. And you've also had going into last week, which is one of the reasons they lost 41-10, to the offensive line had at least three significant injuries. And we're talking, again, on the IR, out for the season. Again, these are not things where they're like, well, we'll just tape it up and they'll play through. They'll, they'll grit through. Like, these are guys that are not taking the field. And as a result, if you can get to Matthew Stafford, who, you know, can beat the blitz with quick releases, but is also susceptible. I believe he was sacked five times in that Arizona game alone. And the Cardinals are not exactly, you know, those 85 those 85 bears as far as the, you know, the wall, the big wall coming in to crush you there. Um, you know, this is not Buddy Ryan's uh, defense here. Uh, they they made life miserable for the Rams all day. So you've got two teams that are going to have to play through injuries. The Niners, in the recent times, have played well at SoFi Stadium. In fact, usually in the last year and a half, two years, the 
49er fans have been more loud, more vocal, and, and better represented. In fact, Rams were begging their fans, don't sell your tickets on StubHub and let these Niners fans come in and turn it into, you know, Levi Stadium South. But that's pretty much what happened. There's, it's not, it's not going to feel like a home game, you know, when you're playing in Texas Stadium or, you know, Dallas, AT&T Park, where it feels like there's, you know, millions of Cowboy fans shouting at you on every play. Like, it's going to be fairly even at, at, at worst for 49ers, Rams fans there. And again, John McVay, like, if you read his post-game comments after the Arizona beatdown, he was angry. He was angry at himself. He was angry at his team. He was angry at the situation. They're just going to come out swinging hammers. And the Niners better be prepared. Because quite frankly, they look flat against the Vikings. They haven't won in Minnesota now since 1992. That's eight straight losses on the road, no matter what stadium the Vikings are playing in. So that that was not an effort I was particularly pleased with. They ended up losing the game by six, despite you know having blocked punts, interceptions, fumbles, uh, four you know turning it over on downs at least twice, once in the red zone on the two yard line, getting a fourth and two and not converting. So as bad as they played, they were still in the game, more or less. <clears throat> but they're going to have to have a much, much better effort. I would not be shocked if the Rams pull this out because this is their season. They go 0-3 uh, with the Seahawks looking fine and Arizona looking better than they did a year ago. 0-3 with two division losses already, That's you're putting yourself in a real uh, corner there. So I would expect a desperate, angry Rams team, and I hope, like I say, the Niners can just match that and escape. I don't care if it's Jake Moody field goals. I don't care if we win 13 to 10 and all of our points were on his leg. If we're in field goal range and he can kick in and it goes through the uprights, it still counts. But we got to figure out a way to just escape, get through these injuries, and, and be healthy you know, for the stretch run in the season. So what's your pick for the game? What's the score? I think... <clears throat> I think the realist in me says Rams, uh, you know, 22. And, you know, if if the Niners don't completely go into a shell, you know, maybe they can get 14. So maybe it's 22-14 or 22-17 with a Jake Moody kick. You know, my heart says find a way to win any way you can. But I just, like I said, the Rams have never been in this position under Sean McVay. So whatever speech he gave him this morning or last night, you know, in the pregame meal or whatever, I'm sure it was a barn burner. So they're just, like I say, and and because they don't have Cooper Cup and Puka Ndatua, it's going to be somebody else you've never heard of, like Jordan Mason two weeks ago, who suddenly is going to have like six catches for 137 yards, hopefully not a 97-yard touchdown recover, you know, reception like we gave up in the Vikings. But somebody you have not heard of or drafted on your fantasy team is going to step up for the Rams today somewhere and is going to, you know, hopefully not be the difference maker. So I think 22-14 Rams is what I is what I realistically think is going to happen. But the fan in me says, go find a way to do it, Niners, because we believe. <laughs> All right, Lord Uther, y'all got the Colts today, and the Packers beat on them last week pretty decently. We almost let the game get away from us with uh, our – backup QB. What uh, what do you got going on for Bears Colts? Yeah. A whole lot of a whole another loss for the Bears, which probably sounds pretty crazy. I just don't I, obviously after my little rant earlier, I, I I don't I don't see a way out of this. I don't know what a way out of this is. And and I love giving you guys these analogies all the time. Sometimes <clears throat> Sometimes as a coach, right, you know what your weakness is going into a season, so you will drill that more than you will, obviously, your, what your strengths are. So when I would have teams that were strong offensively, then we were doing a lot of defensive drills to try and get ready for the season, right? Obviously, if I had a team that was good at pressing, maybe we could get turnovers, then I was focusing on three-point shooting or getting the ball inside, right? So you focus on those things because once the season starts, it's extremely tough to make those corrections and get them to stick because the season has started. I don't see 
any solution to this offensive line during the season. I don't see any. I, I don't know how they're going to practice their way out of it. I mean, I think a great example is, is again, kind of what you know, Gold Rush is talking about there is a lot of these players, they sit out all week and they just play on game day because they're trying to avoid being hurt. They're trying to keep themselves as, as healthy as possible at different times. So I think the idea of practicing and making it better is, is a struggle. Um, so that's why I don't, I don't see anything getting better here for the Bears. I, I just I don't. And unless it's seriously addressed this upcoming offseason, which I have zero faith in that, once again, I hate to say. And here I was in the in the preseason talking about how I thought they were going to make it to the playoffs. You were scared I, to be no. hopeful. You were scared to be hopeful. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, yes, but I would think that management would have addressed the offensive line issue. So the Bears are 30th. Their QB is ranked 30th in the league. Their offense is ranked 29th. Their defense is ranked ranked eighth. Special teams is seventh. Turnovers are eighth. San Francisco's offense, offensive rank is fourth. Defense is nineteenth. Special teams is twenty sixth. Turnovers is seventh. Green Bay's offense is third. Defense twenty fifth. Special teams nineteen. Turnovers they are ranked second in turnovers. Is that <clears throat> Is that we get turnovers or we give up turnovers? Sorry. You're giving them up. Oh, okay. You're giving up turnovers. So why, why am I bringing all this up? Like I've said before, you've got a defense, but you your offense is literally, you know, in last place almost. Right. Thank God What's going to get better? True. Yes. That's yeah, right. I, if we could play them every game, we might have a chance. So, um, I, I know one of the better defensive players is out for Indy this week. Um, right now, it's a pick 'em game, and I pick 'em to lose by at least a touchdown today. I, I don't know what changes now. Maybe Eberflus puts together a game plan and somehow they pull one out. I, I just I don't. I'm a Debbie Downer for all my Bears fans out there, and maybe it's just. Years and years and years of frustration. You know, my, my friends that were are Cubs fans, I can see why it was getting to the point with a lot of them before they made a World Series run that they were just done with it. One of my friends gave up, so gave up his Bears tickets this year, my buddy Scott, gives up his Bears tickets that he's had for, whatever, 15 years, gives them up, sends a text like, you know, first game of the season, I wish I would have kept him, you know, what, you know, I thought, you know, it looks like it's better. And then last week he's like, yeah, I knew there was a reason why I gave him up because the bears just can't solve their problems. It's just, it would be a waste of money. So, you know, you, you, I keep waiting for bears because the Cubs fans were starting to do that a little bit where they weren't showing up. Like if you want it, if you want it to get better, if you want them to sell a team, you can't show up. You got to stay away. Will they do that? I don't. Then again, I'm going to tune into the game today, right? That's true. So That's what's, right. the, what's the score going to be? You said lost by a touchdown. You think it's going to be a low scoring or high scoring affair? I'll go 21 14 Colts. Okay. Medium, medium scoring? That's what I'll do. I'm sure there'll be some offensive turnover at some point that. I, I, how about this? Let's go over under on how many times Caleb Williams is sacked. I will go four. Let I will go. He'll be sacked four times. I'll over or under for you guys? Under. I'd say three or less. I, not that the Bears' offensive line suddenly learns how to block the Colts. Like they're just again, you're just not afraid of them. Like oh my God, if we don't block these guys, our guys go into the hospital. So I just yeah, he'll have time yeah. in the pocket. I'm I'm going to take the under on that as well. I think it's going to be three. Um, All right. I'd be a little shocked if it's more than that. So I'll write it down. Fair so enough. we'll 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 see what happens. Uh, what about the package? We'll see. They have a real coach at least. 
Yeah, um, I, I think we're in a good spot. Uh, there was some rumor this week that Love might play. I think they're going to hold him out this week because I don't think the Titans, even at home, are going to be, you know, it's not a must-win game. Of course, we want to win, but I think we saw enough last week for Malik. We activated Sean Clifford for the game, so if Malik can't deliver, I think Clifford will. He knows the offense a little better. They're going to manage the game. I think they're going to try and run the ball. I, I don't think the Titans' defense can stop the run very well. Um, it's better than the Colts' defense, so I think we're going to struggle. But I think it's a close game. I think we do pull out the win, uh, regardless of who starts at quarterback or who finishes at quarterback. I, I'm not super impressed with our receiving core this year. There's been a lot of bad drop passes. Uh, I don't know where Christian Watson is. Uh, I took him in my fantasy draft, and now I'm pissed because he's done nothing this year, and that's just an extension of all the nothing he's been doing over the last couple of years. He's caught a few balls in a few games and made some big plays, but I'd say it, but Christian Watson, this is you know put up or shut up time. I'd try and trade him, to be honest. I'd try and trade Christian Watson and bring in a vet receiver. Even if they're going to come in as your number three receiver, you're getting an upgrade from what you got. I know Christian Watson's young. I know he's seen some flashes of greatness. I don't think he gets the job done. I think you've got better guys, better talent on the roster right now where he's got enough trade value yet. Somebody's going to want him. Maybe the Bears. Maybe another team that needs a second option or a third option at wideout with some possibilities of big plays. But I'm sorry, Christian Watson. I've lost faith in you. Prove me wrong. Uh, I'm going to take the pack. Uh, we're going to go 23-21. Uh, I think it's a squeaker. I think we get a couple of late field goals to seal the deal, um, but it's going to be tough. Uh, we also got the problem of our kicker's a little hurt, too, so I don't know. I think he's going to play, um, but I don't know how that's going to go. I certainly hope it goes well for him. I don't think it was a bad injury, but he's going to be our saving grace today. Um, that's all I got to say about let's, that. Let's throw a wild card into this here, uh, Ursa Master. If you can manage the game, again, at, is it? It's, they're on the road against the Titans, right? If you can manage yep. the game and, and get your squeaker victory, that's fine. We hear you as a Packer fan. But what if Malik Williams or what's his name? Malik Williams? Malik Allen? What's Who's the quarter? Who's your quarter? Uh, yeah, I just know him as Malik. <laughs> We're on a first name basis. Just Malik. Um what, how do you feel as a Packer fan if he's asked to win the game? Like suddenly the Packer down 14 nothing in the second quarter, and basically he has to be the guy to get them back into it. Again, I know you're not sweating this. It's not for the division. It's not even in the same yeah. conference. But I'm saying, do you still have confidence that if, if he was forced into a role where he had to go out and win the game, you think he could do it? Or are you saying that that's a sure recipe for a defeat? Oh, it's a far cry uh, from a, a for sure thing either way, I think. Um, I think he, sh he showed competence, but I think I pull Malik. If, if we're in a situation where the quarterback and the arm has to win the game, I don't think he knows the offense well enough to do it. Um, I'm not saying he's not talented. He's a good player. I just don't think he knows our offensive scheme well enough to win, and I don't think you can simplify it enough to fool – the Titans defense. Sean Clifford, I think, would be the guy I'd put in if we need the quarterback to win the game. Um, he, I don't think he has the best game managing capability, but he's got the better arm. And I think if you need to throw the ball to win the game, he's the one you want to have do it. Because I think he just knows the plays we have in our back pocket if we needed something to win the game. I think Malik could make, you know, competent serviceable throws. If we need a first down, we need to move down the field in the field goal range, Malik can do it. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Again, this week, it's kind of a toss up for me. Uh, you've got both quarterbacks active. If you really need somebody to win the game and Malik's not getting it done on first and second down, I'm putting in Sean Clifford. Right. All right. Real quick, before we sign off here, gentlemen, there are three teams that had Super Bowl aspirations. We're not going to talk about the Cardinals or the Colts. or. Other. All right, gentlemen, uh, last but definitely not least, there are three Super Bowl aspiring teams when the season started 
that right now are facing themselves in an 0-2 hole, uh, some in the division, some out of the division, but they nobody wants to start 0-3. Nobody. So, gentlemen, Baltimore, the Bengals, and the Rams are all looking at, you know, getting out of their slide or falling even in deeper. Which of those three squads today, look at the schedule, look at the opponents, look at everything else, who can ill afford to take that third loss this early in the season and still be winless heading into the last week of September? Uh, uh, no, I'm going. Anyway, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go Baltimore. Um, when you're not giving that ball to Derrick Henry and just letting him finish that game because your quarterback feels like they have to perform the heroics, at least that's the way I read that situation, there, there's, I think they're in, they're in some trouble. I, I'm going to take it one step further and throw in a team that you did not mention just because they have a win, and I think that's Dallas. I think Dallas and Baltimore are both in a spot that if they don't get wins, let alone make the playoffs, it, it's it's over, Johnny. We're going to sweep the leg, and we're going to see some head coaches get fired, and we're going to see, I don't know if they're going to disassemble a team, but man, signing Dak Prescott and Lamar Jackson to those salaries, and we've had this discussion before, and you've only heard it here, only here, on Cut the Cheese, Poke the Bear, Roast the Niner, which is very Subscribe easy. Subscribe and share. Yeah, dear, dear. That we're seeing more and more guaranteed money. These NFL teams never wanted to give guaranteed money so they could cut players loose when they're not performing the way, way they want them to. But we're seeing the guaranteed money now, which is strapping down these teams, which I'm taking this question way further than it was meant to go, and that's too bad. That's too bad. But now this is a problem with the guaranteed money. And, and the next time there's a negotiation or something comes up with the union, these teams are going to have to try and figure something out so they still have the cap space if they cut these guys loose. Um, they've invested their entire, like their future is wrapped up in these players. And if they don't win this year, they're going to look like, Jerry Jones is going to look like a fool, and we know he doesn't like to look like a fool, right? And Baltimore is, is just going to, a team that should have consistently be making runs in the Super Bowl, even Dallas, to me they're the same team with the same set of expectations. They're both in trouble. Problem. Yeah. So, so, so who wins today? Take What's that. Point? You said Baltimore can't afford to lose, but do they beat Dallas in Dallas with everything on the table? That's a pick 'em game. Zero zero tie. <laughs> you know how I go with that. I'm I'm gonna take the home team. Okay. But I'm actually gonna take Baltimore in this one because I, I think they're desperate. Okay. You 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 can't and I think they're I think they're a I just think they're a better team. I think they're a better coach team too. So I'll go Baltimore, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to go by field goal, yeah. just by field goal. Ursa, yeah, Graham, I uh, yeah. Who do you? Who I, do you think? He has to agree with me. He has no choice because he knows it's true. Girl, you know it's true. I think true. I boy, it's tough. It's a really tough one uh, to call. I just want to the the whole quarterback situation. I think Lamar Jackson and Dak Prescott are both awful quarterbacks. I really, I've always thought that Lamar Jackson's the same problem Colin Kaepernick had. No, no hate to cap. I, I like him as a person. I love the stuff he stands for. He's an awful quarterback. He's a glorified running back who can sometimes throw a ball. Lamar Jackson's the same person. Uh, so is Dak Prescott, except Dak can't run very well. Um, I'm taking the Ravens in that game, but I think the team that really can't afford to lose today is Cincinnati. They're playing the Commanders at home, and, uh, Commanders in Cincinnati, um, and you can't lose to the Commanders at home. First of all, the Commanders, while they've looked better this year, they're still terrible. Yes. Um, so you got to win that game. I mean, that, like, L.A., they don't want to go 0-3, but they could easily go 0-3, and, and it's the Niners. I mean, that is a matchup where it's a rivalry, it's in the division, if you lose that game, as long as it's a hard-fought game, I don't feel so bad about it. Ravens, Cowboys, either team, they both want to win. To be honest, I don't think either one makes or breaks their season here today. Even if they, even if the Ravens go 0-3, I, 
they could come back from that at least to make the playoffs. I, I still don't think they're very good. Um, but it's the Bengals that have like a snowball's chance to start with. They cannot lose to the Commanders and feel good about their season in any way, shape, or form because that's a team that at best is aiming for 500 uh, or thereabouts since 500 is not really achievable anymore. Um, they are looking at a terrible, terrible season if they lose to the Commanders this early on. I know it's not exactly their path to the playoffs in jeopardy here, but that is a bad team. That'd be like losing to Carolina. Like if 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 the Raiders lose today against Carolina, that is a bad sign for your season. So yeah, I'm I'm taking Cincinnati's got to win today. Uh, I think it's going to be close. I really think it's going to be close and it's going to be embarrassing. But if they win, it sets them on the right track to getting their crap together for the rest of the season. The Bungles are giving seven and a half at home against Washington. Think about that. Right. Whoa. Anyway. So I'm going to completely mix it up and not pick any of the three teams we just talked about who are Super Bowl aspirants. I'm talking about a team that was predicted to play competently. You know, let's say they had playoff aspirations, and I believe it's the 0-2 Jaguars who have been up and down these last few years. They've, they've looked like they might be able to pull it together. You know, they have, they have their Super Bowl coach and they have their quarterback and they have, you know, they have a decent running game at, you know, at times. But they're also in a hole again. And unlike, let's say, the San Diego Chargers or so forth, uh, the L.A. Chargers now, who used to start off sluggish and then somehow find a way to scratch and claw, crawl back their way into the, into the postseason. Like, I think the Jaguars fan base is a little skeptical. I don't think they're ready to really believe in this squad and your London games and appearances notwithstanding, if you're not producing, you know, like I say, if you start off 0 and 3, 0 and 4, 1 and 5, it's like uh, Lord Uther says, they're just not going to show up. There's plenty to do in Florida. Uh, there's plenty of ways to, you know, and they'll still watch them on the NFL on Fox, but the, the attendance will probably take a hit and people will just say, I don't believe in this team. So for me, the Jaguars need to figure out a way to start winning some games. You know, Doug Peterson is the coach, you know, he needs to, you know, get that locker room turned around in a hurry or yeah, they're just going to blow that thing up again. And again, I, I don't think we, any of us had Jaguars winning the Super Bowl, but this was a team that people said, yeah, they can beat the Cowboys last season or they can, you know, they can make life interesting for you. And I, I think an 0-3 start there just tells the fan base, forget it, wait till next year. So I say Jags. Who do so, they have this week, uh, Lord Uther? Who, who do the Jaguars Jags are playing have? tomorrow night. Uh, no, uh, yeah, tomorrow night against the Bills at 6.30. See, look at that. Um, I mean, uh, Buffalo's Buffalo? given five and a half. Yeah, Buffalo's underdog. In Orchard I don't Park, think... that's what I'm saying. They're at home. Home. Yeah. So that's yeah. wrong. That'll be a weird game. I'm uh, taking I might watch little... that over the Commanders Bengals game because <laughs> I don't give a shit about those teams. <laughs> but NFL fans, we have cut the cheese, we have poked the bear, and we have roasted the Niner today. Join us next week for more NFL sports action here on Pending Rebrand. Make sure you subscribe, share, drop us a comment with your favorite teams, your predictions, and tell us where we're wrong. And with that, are you ready for more football? Yes!